welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. We've all seen the pictures of what's going on at the border. Migrant families and refugees living in subhuman conditions, a breakdown of the rule of law, of sanitation, and basic human decency. Children torn from their families. But seeing it on the nightly news or on cable is far different than seeing it up close and personal. What's worse is that none of it is necessary. It's all the result of cruel actions, bad policy, and its net result for America is not to make us safer, but to fuel bigotry, hate, and scapegoating. Worst of all, it comes from a deep strain in the American DNA that has reared its ugly presence too many times in our history. It's a history we don't seem to learn from, and one we should have outgrown by now. We're going to talk about this with a man who has seen it all up close and personal and is trying valiantly to redress the situation. He is Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley, and in addition to authoring legislation to try and deal with some of these issues, he's the author of a new book entitled America is Better Than This, Trump's War Against Migrant Families. Senator Merkley, thanks so much for joining us. Well, you're very welcome. Good to be with you. Talk about your early trips, your early forays down to the border and and what you saw there personally. Yes, it was just in the beginning of of June of last year, 2018, when I was reading a speech by the former Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, that he'd given a couple days before called Zero Tolerance. And I thought, oh, zero tolerance. Well, that sounds like tough on crime, not surprising from a Republican administration six months out from the election. And as I read the details, it became clear to me that it envisioned ripping children out of their parents' arms at the border. And I said to those around me, There is no way they're actually doing this. No American president or presidential team would ever embrace deliberately harming children as a political strategy to deter immigration. And someone said to me on my team said, well, there's one way to find out, go down to the border. And I thought that absolutely right. And I, so I flew down to the border that Sunday and became the first member of of Congress to get into a a Customs and Border Protection Processing Center, saw the children after they had been torn from their parents' arms, being sorted into these chain-link cages in a warehouse, and I was just stunned, just just absolutely stunned. I could not believe it. The press had never been allowed in. And shortly after, I, I... a couple hours later, I, I, had, I went up the road to Brownsville. I had heard that many of these separated children, these boys, were by the hundreds being stuffed into a place, a former Walmart uh, run by Southwest Keys called Casa Padre. So I went up there, knocked on their door, and asked to see what was going on. And they didn't like the fact I was uh, in the parking lot and called the police on me. And it <laughs> kind of conveyed to Americans uh, that, that the administration wanted to keep secret what it was doing. But it also ended the secrecy. So that launched me on this uh, effort to, to uh, find out all the details at the different complex parts of the system and and uh, take on trying to end it. There, there's this weird irony in the whole thing where the idea of some of this, going back to, to what Sessions said and, and certainly what's been said by others in the administration, that it is meant to be a deterrence, that it is meant to be punitive— and yet there is this sense of secrecy about it that in a way there's a kind of cognitive dissonance to that. Yes, the administration did talk publicly about this uh, just 13 days in, after the inauguration of President Trump. And the following month, the head of the Department of Homeland Security, John Kelly, talked about it. The following month, they, they launched a, a pilot project in San Diego sector of the border. But at that point, they went secret. And they went secret through May of the following year when Jeff Sessions gave his speech. I think the reason they went from the secret program to the the public speech about it was because it was six months out from the election. The Republicans were looking for a fear factor to stir up Americans in the November 2018 election, and nothing seemed to fit. Uh, Ebola didn't fit. ISIS didn't fit any longer. So they doubled down on immigration and said, we're, gonna, we're just going to be super tough on immigration and send that message, but super tough in this case meant harming kids. 
One of the things that, that is going on down there is that so much of the, the activity there flies in the face of existing laws, existing court decisions. Talk a little bit about that. Now, the president's team keeps implementing regulations that are in direct contravention, contravention of American law, and the courts keep striking them down. Uh, for example, uh, the, team, the, the Trump team said, we are not going to allow there to be an asylum process for folks who cross the border between ports of entry. And our law specifically says that you can apply for the asylum process crossing between ports of entry uh, because it's in contravention of existing law and uh, of uh, the Refugee Convention to turn away someone and not give them safe harbor if they're fleeing persecution. And uh, also, those folks crossing between the ports of entry, those are often the folks who came to the port of entry where the administration is blockading them, sending them back into Mexico, uh, putting them on a wait list that can be months, so they're stranded in, in dangerous border towns with no friends or, or family or, or funds. And so in desperation, they cross between ports of entry deliberately to surrender themselves to, uh, to Border Patrol officials. So the, they, they, they put forward this regulation, and, and the courts immediately struck it down. And, and to what extent has the administration responded to those court decisions? They seem to be on a plan where they have a, a list of items that they roll out every few days just to keep immigration in the, in the news. For example, the president talked about, I don't have enough money, so we're not going to let kids outside to play soccer because that costs money at the child prisons that the administration is, is, is operating. And then they said, well, we're not going to give flu shots uh, at the CBB processing centers, even though three children died of, uh, of flu. And uh, they said, we're going to appeal a decision that we have to provide toothpaste and soap and bedding to children. And that's horrific. Who, who can imagine an American government saying they want the freedom to not provide soap or bedding or toothbrushes, just basic hygiene necessities uh, to, to children? And yet that goes right along with this administration strategy of inflicting trauma on the kids. How much of what we're seeing today is, is a result not just of, of the policy of the Trump administration, but really has been something that has been festering for a long time because of such long neglect of this issue and really dealing with immigration in a more holistic way? Well, I think mostly we're seeing a manifestation of the strategy of division that Trump campaigned on and has uh, taken into the Oval Office. He campaigned, he attacked African Americans, Haitian Americans, Latino Americans, women Americans, Americans with disabilities, Muslim Americans. And I must say in office, he really then directed the bulk of his attacks on immigrants. Maybe they're the easiest target because they're not they're coming from outside the, the country. But it's a, it's, it's a manifestation, and there's a, a racist strain to this. The president talks about liking refugees from Norway. Uh, he has a member of his administration who just uh, announced that the words carved into the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, were only meant for Europeans, in other words, white people. Uh, so we're, we're seeing a real manifestation. I mean, there's something tribal in the, in the human uh, instincts. And when you have a president deliberately exacerbate those tribal divisions by ethnicity, by color of your skin, by, by the country you come from, it's an easy target. This is used by, by folks who have kind of a dictatorial intent across the world, but it's not America. We need to stand against this strategy of hate and division. And we certainly have to stand against the strategy of deliberately targeting children. What tools does Congress currently have or, or trying to have to address some of these issues? Well, existing law and existing court decisions are a tool, and then, of course, modifying those. The challenge with modifying them is that the Republican Party has stood in the way of past deals. For example, we had in 2013 
Democrats and Republicans in the Senate come together. It was called the Group of Eight, forged it, four, four Democrats, four Republican senators. And uh, it passed overwhelmingly in the Senate with bipartisan support to address the, it was a comprehensive immigration bill to fix this broken system. Security at the border, security at the point of employment, security for folks overstaying their visas, which, by the way, is the largest source of undocumented individuals in the United States of America. A pathway to citizenship for those who arrived previously, a instant uh, legal recognition. It had a whole, and using visas to address the job shortage uh, that might emerge in agriculture or in high tech, et cetera. It was a comprehensive fix. It was killed by the Republican leadership in the House without a debate and without a vote. Bipartisan Senate bill killed by the Republicans. I feel they want to maintain immigration as an election issue. They don't want to fix a broken system. Talk a little bit about the legislation that you have introduced to try and address some of these issues, particularly with respect to children. Yes, this legislation shows the deep division that has uh, become present between the two parties. You have on the Republican side a bill that allows the the long-term imprisonment of children, and it has 40 sponsors. It would also allow internment camps across the country to lock up migrant families for long periods of time. No Democrats have sponsored it. And there's my bill, which basically says treat children humanely. It's called the End or Stop the Cruel Treatment of Migrant Children Act. It has 40 re- Democratic sponsors, and I haven't been able to get a single Republican to sponsor it. But it would, it would end the border blockade that leaves children stranded in, in Mexico. It ends the cold, holding in freezing cold uh, holding cells that are referred to as um, ice blocks. Uh, by the uh, uh, Spanish word hieleras. Uh, it would uh, stop the process of, uh, of keeping kids locked up for months in internment, not internment camps, influx facilities that are essentially prisons currently exempted from the Flores requirement of no more three, than three days of imprisonment. It would apply Flores uh, to them. In fact, it would shut down the for-profit versions of this. Uh, there should be no for-profit contracts in a child prison system uh, that incentivize keeping kids locked up. Uh, so, it, And it would make sure that children, uh, had, we had the case workers and the field workers to be able to establish the sponsors so children could be with families and in school and in parks and playgrounds as they await adjudication of their asylum status. So it's just basic treat, humane treatment of children as they await the outcome of their legal proceedings. Talk a little about the Flores Agreement from 1997, which really was was intended to limit the amount of time that children could be held. Yes, it did several things. It said the, you can only hold children for three days in a, in a non-state licensed facility. It that had a more flexibility added to it, up to 20 days during a period of high influx, just recognizing there's a huge wave of immigrants uh, arriving that, that might at, at moments overwhelm the system. It said that not only state licensing, but state inspection, uh, that outside groups, both lawyers and doctors, can in, inspect to see if the standards are being maintained. It main, it's laid out humane treatment standards for, for hygiene and for nutrition and for the housing. It proceeded uh, to do these things, and the administration hates it. It has been their primary target. They do not want there to be in place an agreement, a settlement, for the humane treatment of children. And that includes, they don't want the state licensing, the state inspections, the outside inspections, the humane treatment standards, and they certainly, most of all, don't want the restriction on how long they can imprison kids. Where does this go from here? (laughs) I should add (laughs) that this last week, they issued a regulation to try to replace Flores. Flores says that if it's implemented by regulation, it goes away. However, what the administration is doing is not implementing Flores, they're destroying Flores. And so in that sense, I think it'll be another case where the courts are going to step in and say you're violating the law, this regulation cannot stand. I certainly hope so. And to the extent that the administration continues to violate that law, even if the courts say otherwise, what recourse is there? 
Well, the recourse really is only going back to the judge who administers the laws or the, the, the settlement, Judge G, and uh, get a new ruling saying, no, you really have to obey this. Uh, because it isn't like a law that says if you violate this, uh, you'll, it's a civil penalty or a criminal penalty. Uh, so that's that's the challenge. Administration that doesn't want to give flu shots and doesn't want to hand out toothbrushes and doesn't 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 want to uh, provide a, a sleeping mat uh, is not one you can trust uh, to administer humane treatment under existing settlements or, or laws, and that's a big piece of the problem. It's why ultimately this, there's the, we will fight at every level, but in the end, I don't think the inhumane determination to inflict trauma on children is going to end until Trump is voted out of office. To what extent do you see the situation down there continuing to get worse? Has anything been done to, to improve sanitation, to improve the conditions in any way? The intense public attention has brought improvements. Also, um, I've won the ability uh, through the appropriations bill. I pushed for a specific provision that gives congressional access because the administration was doing all it could to block congressional access. Uh, So that has helped increase transparency. Within transparency, people are a little more on edge about how they how they provide uh, um, conditions in the camps. And so there, they, there has been some improvement in, in that. Uh, the uh, the tor- Torneo Influx Facility, a notorious facility in the desert, has been shut down last January after a lot of, of public uh, attention to it and pressure as well as internal pressure from the contractor, a nonprofit, CB, uh, BCFS, that, that decided – that it was not being the children were not being well served, and it wanted to get out of the contract. And no other contractor picked it up because of the uh, bad reputation of the administration strategy. So it was shut down. But meanwhile, the administration expanded Homestead, a for-profit child prison in Florida, run by a corporation called Caliburn. And there is corruption at the heart of this. The first level of corruption is that John Kelly served on the board of the company that ran the camp before he became the Secretary of Homeland Security. As secretary, he advocated for the imprisonment of children. And then as soon as he was out of the administration, he immediately was returned to a high-paying position on the board of the company that controls the camp. That's one level of corruption. The other level of, of corruption is simply incentives for a for-profit company to keep children locked up. It's a non-compete contract worth hundreds of millions of dollars in the form of payments that equate to about $750 per day per child. And finally, Senator, talk a little bit about your involvement in this. We, We talked about you going down to the border early on, but being from Oregon, it's hardly a border state. Talk a little bit about how you've been personally galvanized by this issue. This treatment of children is something that touches the heart of every American. It doesn't matter where you live. We all grew up with the vision of the Statue of Liberty shining her torch to the oppressed. The, this administration has snuffed out that torch, and I think all Americans are determined, are concerned about, about ending this period of darkness and relighting that torch. So that's why it's relevant no matter where you live in the in the in the in the country and i can tell you i've I've traveled the country and people come up to me everywhere and say this matters to them they can't believe it's happening american government our government our taxpayer money our land attacking and inflicting cruelty to children it's absolutely evil and wrong under any religious tradition or moral code And we have to end it. No one else will. We, the American people, have to end it. Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley. Senator, I thank you so much for spending time with us today on the Who, What, Why podcast. You're very welcome. We need to make sure that as the president does one tweet after another, changing the topic, we don't forget uh, that children are being mistreated by our government and that we have to end it. Thank Thank you you so much. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why.
I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.